for recording. So hello all, my name is Sarah Britt and I'm the project manager at ICPSR. I work on the Health and Medical Care Archive, or HIMCA, the dedicated archive of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is sponsoring today's webinar. HIMCA has almost 300 free data sets on healthcare, health attitudes and opinions, and series data for you all to explore. I'll post a link to our website in the chat. Some of those series data include the profile survey on state and territorial public health. These surveys are carried out by the Association of the State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO. Today we have Christy Meadows and Elizabeth Woods here to talk about the 2019 profile survey on state and territorial public health. Christy Meadows is the director at the Public Health Agency Research and Business Intelligence and leads ASTO's research portfolio, including the largest data collection at ASTO, the profile of state and territorial public health. She previously worked as a research analyst and project manager at Westat, where she led numerous research projects related to patient safety, healthcare delivery, public health, and juvenile justice. We also have Elizabeth Woods. She's a senior an analyst analyst in public health agency research and business intelligence. She currently leads research and analysis for ASTO's annual environmental scan and supports the profile of state and territorial public health. Prior to her work at ASTO, Elizabeth held research roles at the California Department of Public Health, CDPH's Environmental Health Laboratory, and the California Emerging Infections Program as a member of Healthcare Associated Infections Community Interface, or HAIC the research team in the John Hopkins Institute for Health and Pro Productivity Studies. Before I hand over the mic, I want to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made publicly available via YouTube. Audience questions are welcome and may be submitted during the presentation via the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll cover these questions at the end of the presentation. A live transcript script is available. To show or hide the transcript, click the up arrow on the live transcript or closed captions button. Please note for those viewing on a phone or tablet, the Zoom app currently highlights only the active speaker. The live transcript will still be available, but you may need to scroll to the left or right to see the presenter or the presentation. And for privacy, all participants are in listen only mode with microphones muted and chat between participants unavailable. So thank you so much for attending and Christy and Elizabeth, you can take it away. Thanks so much, Sarah. Hi everyone, we're so thrilled to be here to talk a little bit about the ASTO profile survey. So today we'll focus primarily on 2019, but we also thought we would take the opportunity to discuss the 2022 survey as well, and what you can look forward to in the next year with that data. Um, so as far as our agenda today, we'll do an introduction of the ASTO profile survey. We'll also go into some 2019 data highlights from the survey, and then we'll also talk again about the 2022 survey development, and then we'll turn it over to all of you for Q&A. So uh, I thought I should start by talking a little bit about ASTO. So that's the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and it's a nonprofit organization that provides support to our members, which are the state and island health officials within all the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the eight island areas, including the five U.S. territories and the three freely associated states. So an overview of the ASTO profile survey, um, it was launched in 2007. And we fielded it about every two to three years. Um, the profile is the only comprehensive source of information on state and territorial um, health agencies. And we collect data on a number of um, infrastructure related topics. So that is the activities that they conduct in each health agency, their structure and their governance of each health agency, the workforce capacity that they have, the finances that go into the health agencies. So these are specifically looking at expenditures and not funding from, um, from various agencies. Um, so we were really focused on what the state is spending money on, the quality improvement activities that they're involved in. And then we also included informatics and health equity as new sections in 2022. For context, um, the informatics section did um, exist in 2016. It was removed in 2019. And we knew that this was going to be a hot topic um, during the pandemic. So we decided to add it back in for 2022 and revamp it and update it. Um, health equity is a brand new section. So that is a section that we have never fielded before. 
kind of circling back to structure and governance, we've also included a subsection of the governance classification section. So this is focusing on relationships between local health departments and state health state health departments to update classifications on governance. Um, the last time this was completed was in 2012. So it's been about a decade and it was time to do that. I also thought it would be helpful to give an overview of the differences between the state and the islands uh, surveys. So um, the states has all of the topics that I just previously talked about in the last slide, while the island areas have a little bit of nuance to them. So they may include additional activities that are related to the populations that these agencies are serving. Um, in agency governance, they are not asked governance classification sections. So in 2022, you will not see that section in the island area survey. And then addition Additionally, they have a, a, a shortened finance section, so we typically only ask them about their total budget, uh, whereas in the state survey, we typically have a, a lot more uh, complex finance section that asks more, more about breakouts of federal agencies and things like that. In terms of methods, so I've already discussed that this is a longitudinal survey, it's fielded every three years. But our respondents are primarily the senior deputies within the health agencies. Um, these are typically the champions at the agency, though they can designate another point of contact if they're too busy to take the survey. Um, and they kind of farm it out across the agency. So we have health uh, or HR directors who are completing the workforce section, CFOs that are completing the finance section, IT directors completing the informatics section, and, and so on. So they are farming it out to the SMA within that agency that makes the most sense for the survey. In terms of response rate, we've had a consistently high response rate from all the states, um, and we have had most of the island areas both in 2019 and 2022. In terms of secondary data sources that we use, the largest one is PH Wins. So that is a survey that is conducted by the De Beaumont Foundation, primarily looking at workforce data, um, demographics, things like that. Um, we use their demographics information as well as their salary information, and this is largely an effort to reduce burden among the states. Um, additionally, we also include secondary data uh, from the Census, the World Bank, and the Public Health Accreditation Board, and this is largely to um, stratify our data in different ways. So we may look at accreditation status or population size or region and other characteristics that may be helpful to look at patterns. So I wanted to ground us in the purpose of the survey. It's really to understand the workforce and the resources that these health agencies have. We want to identify variations in activities. What are the services that they're providing to their communities? And also to contribute um, to the development of best practices within governmental public health. So in terms of our users of data, it's everyone. Um, so we have practitioners, researchers that reach out and, and like to use our data sets for various uh, uses. We also have our ASTO members, of course, our health officials um, who use this data to make decisions. We also provide the data to, of course, our funders and then partner organizations like Public Health Accreditation Board uh, and NHO, which I'll talk about in a minute. We also use this data to inform our own internal staff. Um, they are working to provide technical assistance to states and to support health officials. So this data is really useful in, in helping them plan for that. We also use this information for legislators. So we advocate for public health on the Hill. Um, and additionally, we also use this data to advocate for public health through media and the general public. And this is just to give you an idea of the types of partners that we work with on a regular basis. So I've already mentioned FAB, um, NACHO, which is the National Association of County and City Health Officials. They actually just had a webinar about a month ago for ICPSR. So they're one of our close partners as well. Um, we also uh, have our partner, De Beaumont Foundation, HRSA, and then our two funders are Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as well as CDC. So I've talked a little bit about who uses our data. So how we use our data is it informs policy and advocacy efforts to improve public health funding. So an example of this was it was recently used by the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus to demonstrate the decline in the public health workforce leading up to the pandemic. So it's really useful data. Um, it also informs CDC and other federal agencies about health agency resources. What are their priorities and their needs? 
We, it also informs our technical assistance to health agencies, and then it advocates for public health through those media outlets that I talked about before. So now I'm going to start with 2019 um, data findings. So these will be primarily focused on the agency structures and governance, as well as the activities that they are conducting. So there's a large portion of health agencies that are operating as a freestanding or independent agency. So when you think about a freestanding or independent agency, that's typically one that stands alone. It's a department of health. Um, and then there's a lesser portion that are operating as a under a larger agency. So this is typically ones that operate under a health and human services agency. So when we look at governance of health agencies um, across their across the different states, we see that most of the health agencies are decentralized. So there's a lot of variety on the right hand side when looking at the governance. Um, and then there's about split half almost for the, the structure of the agencies. So the key takeaways here are we know that agencies occasionally restructure, but those structures have largely remained consistent over time. We also know that several states are in the process of restructuring this year, and that's primarily because of the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. And while that won't be captured in the 2022 data, it will be something to look, look out for in 2025 and the changes that will happen to these health agencies. Um, both governance and structure are, are important to understand how agencies may report data within the survey. These characteristics can impact the oversight that an agency has over certain activities and the relationships that they have with their local health departments. So it's really important to keep these things in mind when we're interpreting the data that the states are giving us. In terms of activities highlights, um, health agencies provided more prevention screening and clinical activities to their communities from 2016 to 2019. Uh, they also um, largely provided more behavioral health and injury activities as well as environmental health activities. Though we did see some, de see some decreases in a few of these activities across the states. Uh, health agencies also typically pro have typically provided less oversight for regulation, inspection, and or licensing activities from 2016 to 2019. So these changes indicate an increased focus on potentially heart disease prevention, Medicaid expansion, and the ongoing opioid epidemic, which could have been contributing to some of the changes that we're seeing here. So before we jump into the findings, I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about the activities that we collect information on. Um, so we collect information on most chronic diseases and conditions and focus on activities health agencies are typically involved, um, involved in, and that includes screening, treatment, and population-based primary prevention. Within the survey, we ask states to answer yes or no based on whether they perform the activity directly or by contract. So from 2016 to 2019, 26 prevention, screening, and clinical activities saw an increase across health, health agencies, while only two saw a decrease. So this highlights health agencies' commitment to addressing chronic diseases leading into the pandemic. We also see that skin cancer primary prevention had a fairly large increase in health agencies providing this service. Most other increases that you see on the right side of this slide have to do with cardiovascular related activities, and this could be indicative of new cycles of CDC funding that we were seeing coming out around this time, um, but it also could be due to the establishment of the Million Hearts 2022 priorities. So there's a number of factors that could have been impacting this. Moving on to behavioral health and injury prevention activities, we collect several activities related um, to behavioral health, injury, and violence prevention. These focus on substance misuse, mental health topics, and prevention related to injury and violence services for communities. So in 2019, the heightened focus on addressing the opioid epidemic is evident in the number of behavioral health services that increased in three years. So due to continued concerns over co-occurring substance use, states are responding by offering that population-based primary prevention for drugs and alcohol. They were also addressing the three and a half fold increase in hepatitis C cases that occurred from 2010 to 2016, which may have had an impact on the number of syringe and needle exchange and disposal services that you're seeing here as well. 
while we are mostly seeing large increases in um, several of these behavioral health and injury prevention activities, we did want to acknowledge the decreases in some of these activities as well, specifically the decrease in behavioral health, or sorry, in, in um, sexual assault victim services. So this data point could be a matter of restructure where health agencies no longer have oversight of these activities. So this is another important interpretation of our data. If something moves outside of the public health agency's oversight, that is something that it will no longer be captured. So it doesn't necessarily mean the state is no longer completing the service, but the health agency may not have oversight of it. Um, so this is something that we wanna keep monitoring in 2022. Here are a list of environmental health activities we collect data on in the survey. Health agencies can provide a range of services focused on air quality, water quality, vector control, and more. And what we're seeing here are large increases in a few of the activities, including surface, surface water protection, indoor air quality, and vector control. Um, there were also a few decreases in environmental health activities across health agencies. Uh, changes in environmental health activities may result from changes in funding or changes in state laws. So for example, an increase in federal funding to assist states in responding to the Zika virus may have allowed some of these health agencies to increase the capacity of their vector control programs. So as mentioned before, we also know that health agencies sometimes have environmental health departments sitting outside of their purview, and therefore these data may be impacted by a change in structure. So again, it's important to kind of dive a little deeper to understand what's really happening in these health agencies. As you can see, regulation, inspection, and licensing is one of the largest areas of activities we capture in the survey. So health agencies are typically involved or overseeing a number of regulation uh, services within their communities. The number of health agencies reporting regulatory inspection or licensing services has continued to consistently decrease. And while this may be partially related to that restructure problem, um, we are also trying to monitor these changes over time to see what's really happening in the health agencies, uh, especially when you look at laboratories and you see a 16 percent uh, percentage point decrease. That's something that we would want to look into, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and the focus on labs. And now I will turn it over to Elizabeth Woods, who's going to talk a little bit more about the finance section. Wonderful, thank you so much, Christy, for the introduction. Um, next slide, please. So this slide gives a high level overview of our findings from the 2019 profile expenditure data. We're gonna walk through these one by one in the following slides, um, which will be touching on findings related to health trends and aggregate level expenditures, expenditures by spending category and expenditures by federal agency. Next slide, please. So this slide is showing us that Shaw's or state health agencies are primarily funded by federal agencies as opposed to um, state agencies and other sources. Um, but we have seen an average decrease in federal expenditures by state health ag agencies across the US in recent years. The main takeaway here is that going into the COVID-19 pandemic, state health agencies were spending the least amount of do federal dollars they had in a decade, um, an indication of decreased federal funding leading into agencies' pandemic response. Um, and you'll see the orange arrows pointing to fiscal year 2018, um, which was the fiscal year leading into the pandemic. And you'll see that's the lowest amount on, on the line from 2008. Um, next slide, please. So the highest percentage of state health agencies' federal expenditures originated from the USDA, the CDC, and HRSA in fiscal year 2018. And I believe the same is true in fiscal year 2015. Um, the USDA continues to be state health agency's largest funder, which is not surprising given the size of the WIC program. Um, that being said, it will be interesting to see if this changes in 2022 data, considering the influx of emergency funding from the CDC, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so... Looking at funding from state, federal, and other sources, 
it was clinical services, consumer care, WIC, and the quality of health services uh, that accounted for states' largest expenditures in 2019. Um, this will be an interesting data point to revisit in 2022, or vis revisit in the 2022 data given newly introduced streams of funding for health data, um, health labs, and other related COVID-19 pandemic funding streams. Next up. Okay, so next we have our 2019 workforce data. Um, next slide, please. Now I'll be walking through our state health agency workforce highlights from the 2019 profile data. Um, and again, this slide is offering a high level overview of what we found, but the following slides will elaborate on these in more detail. The most notable finding in the section that, um, that you'll see is that state health agencies were going into the pandemic with the smallest workforce they had in the last decade. And they had extremely limited data, laboratory and informatics staff to assist with the level of data needs that were expected from communities. Um, so on this slide, um, this is showing us that we saw a 10% decrease of public health employees and state public health um, going into the COVID-19 pandemic. The workforce uh, saw a continual decrease since 2012 highlighting continued struggles that state health agencies faced to recruit and retain employees long-term. This data point will be interesting, again, to analyze and revisit in the 2022 data because we know that state health agencies received COVID-19 funding that allowed them to hire staff, but given that this funding was temporary, states may have been hesitant to use the funding for staffing. Next slide, please. Um, so on this slide, you'll see that um, administrative and clinical professionals um, were consistently the largest or accounted for the largest portion of state health agency staff. However, staff in both of those categories saw a decrease between 2016 and 2019. We also saw that laboratory and data professionals with the most had the most limited capacity within health agencies over time. So office and administrative support and business and finance operations staff are the two largest breakouts within the administrative occupation classification. Behavioral health staff and public health nurses are the two largest clinical occupations within health agencies. We saw a decline among all of these occupations leading into the pandemic and all of these declined could have impacted the challenges that we saw during the pandemic, including difficulty with state health agency spending, agencies spending large sums of money quickly and difficulties in individuals receiving access to care either for COVID-19 related illnesses or mental health concerns. We continue to see informatics staff with the least amount of capacity going into 2019. We also saw an increase in epidemiologist staff, but a decrease in laboratory workers. All things um, that may have had implications on the challenges faced in 2020 and beyond by state health agencies. Uh, this data point will be of particular interest when looking at the 2022 data because we will see if and how capacity has changed across state health agencies um, we've also included additional questions in the 2022 survey related to re the retention and recruitment of informatics staff that will be helpful in understanding challenges with recruiting these types of positions um, that have been experienced by state health agencies um, until now. Um, so moving into this next section, we'll be talking about our 2022 profile survey development. Um, which had a number of updates since 2019. Um, so as a result of ASTO's engagement with this diverse group of stakeholders, which included senior deputies, HR directors, chief financial officers, informatics directors, partner organizations, subject matter experts, funders, and public health researchers, um, now more than ever, national and state public health leaders plan to utilize profile data to understand and communicate the state of public health infrastructure 
and strategically advocate for strengthening that infrastructure as we recover from the pandemic and envision a future of the field. Um, so this is a brief overview of our process for updating the 2022 profile survey. Um, so between mid-2021 and early 2022, the ASTO profile team gathered feedback from partner organizations and state health agency leaders to better understand how our survey instrument could capture the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on state public health. We use this feedback to refine our existing survey instrument and inform the development of new survey modules on informatics and health equity. Data collection began in April of 2022, and we began our data validation process to ensure accuracy of our data. Um, and our data validation process includes identifying any changes to state health agencies' previous profile survey responses in all questions, um, flagging large percentage changes in workforce counts and finance um, amounts, uh, flagging discrepancies in state health agencies' responses and other data we have on agencies, including from uh, Public Health Wins, NORC, specifically in the governance categories, NACHO, and um, finally, uh, we check for missing responses or skipped questions um, that may need changing uh, in our final data set. And we'll be wrapping up the data validation process um, in a couple of weeks here. Um, so this slide is going over the changes we made to the structure and governance sections. So um, we thought we'd share a few of the sections that are new to 2022, um, so you know what to expect from the new iteration of the survey and its data set. Um, we added a governance classification section into the survey to update classifications for states, uh, which you'll see at the bottom. For reference, the last time this was completed was in 2012. These classifications help us to better understand the relationships between local and state health departments. Um, and beyond that, the questions asked were based on whether the agency has areas served by health units led by a state employee, areas served by health units led by a local employee or a mix of the two systems. So we have a more granular understanding of state health agency governance. And finally, these questions will allow us to better describe the organization of government public health systems and states, highlight changes over time in government structure, and provide more insight into how local and state public health agencies work together. Um, now talking about the new and improved informatics section, um, we added in and updated our informatics section to focus on informatics infrastructure, including the workforce, governance of data, partnerships, overall data modernization efforts, and health information exchange activities. Um, next slide, please. And finally, we added in a new health equity section. Um, to focus on health equity infrastructures, infrastructure within state health agencies, including health equity activities, leadership, priorities, and trainings offered by the health agency. Um, and this was the first time there's ever a health equity section included in the profile survey, um, which offers us new insight into health equity activities and trends across state public health. Um, and finally, we have our next steps for our 2022 data. So later this year, hopefully very soon, 2022 data will be available on ICPSR. Um, the profile dashboard will be updated with the most recent data at the link you see on the slide now. And ASTO will be disseminating this information widely among funders, partners, and state health agency staff using data briefs, presentations, and other outlets. Um, and I believe that's it. The last slide we have is just our little bios. So um, I'll hand it back to Christy or maybe open it up for questions. That's perfect. Yes, yeah, Sarah, I think we ended a little sooner than we expected, but we can open it up for Q&A. Can you talk a little bit about the forces of change survey that ESTO has done in the past and how that may relate to the profiles? 
Yeah, so I'm not an expert on forces of change. However, um, I, I know that ASTO completed it in the past. We no longer administer forces of change. Um, and I don't know exactly the history there, but that that is the the gist. I know NACHO still um, continues with the forces of change survey, and I think that they presented on that their 2020 data. So if that's something of interest to people, I would encourage them to, to reach out to NACHO. Um, to also give a little bit more context, NACHO is focused on local health departments, just for anyone who may not know that, and we're focused on state health departments. So that would be the differentiation there. So please feel free to put any other additional questions in the Q&A. Um, Christy, do you have any information about how people can link this data with um, sort of like the laws and policies or things that have changed over time? I know we you were talking about a lot of um, the new things that are being studied in the profile, but um, I don't know, just um, a little more broadly how this could be linked to other data or to the laws and policies of different states. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. I think um, we are expanding um, what we're doing with the data right now. That's been a heavy focus of our team is to use the profile data in more ways than it has been done in the past. Um, so right now we're collaborating with our government affairs team that's internal to ASTO. Um, and they've told us that the, the data that they're most interested in is the um, national and state level finance data. So really understanding the expenses. Um, I hear, I don't know, I haven't researched this, but um, I hear that it is easier to find data sets on funding for states and uh, much harder to find data sets on expenses. So that's something that's really unique to the profile and really helpful. Um, so that's something that we'll be looking at. And then additionally, the public health agency research and business intelligence team um, is building out the business intelligence side of the team where they'll be looking at how can we use the profile data, pair it with other data sets and make it more meaningful and useful moving forward. So that is something we're definitely looking into in the, in the next couple of years. Is your website the best place for folks to find what research has been done with the data so far? So ICPSR has a bibliography where we, of course, relate any citations back to your studies, but um, how else can folks see what has been done? Absolutely. So um, yeah, the website is probably the best place. However, uh, we are constantly um, answering data requests. So if there's things of interest to people that maybe we don't have products for, we're always open to hear that and to um, and try and pull the data in more meaningful ways for people. Um, but yeah, I would say website and or reach out to our team directly. I can, I'm happy to provide our email after um, the call. And um, we also have a, an email profile at asto.org. So that's another one where you could email us if you had an interest in a specific part of the survey. Is there anything else that folks should know in terms of the additional questions that are being asked about COVID or what other data might be out there to pair with that? So for example, I guess I'm thinking, I know ICPSR has a um, sort of state level COVID policy database. And I'm wondering um, how this information that you're collecting could be used in conjunction with that. It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I'd have to look into it, um, but I do know that that's something that our team continues to, to think about is how can we pair profile data with other things. However, going back to your original question of like the different questions that we will be asking in profile. So if it's helpful, um, I can give a little more context to some of that because I we focused on governance classification. That's a big change in 2022. We talked about health equity and informatics, but a few of the other things that were, I would say more minor, we didn't change whole sections, but they will be impactful for understanding COVID and what happened to the state health agencies. Um, we included additional questions in the workforce sections. So 
um, looking at, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, a number, a little bit more granular information about certain occupations. So looking at like community health workers, which we hadn't looked at specifically before. Um, we included questions about flexibilities that health agencies were using to retain staff or to recruit staff um, or make their lives easier. Um, and then oh, I think there was a quite a few different workforce questions that were related to COVID that we added in. Um, additionally, we also added a question into the finance section, which will be really interesting to dive into. And that was looking at the percentages that um, health agencies were spending on various aspects of COVID. So whether it be testing or vaccinations or stockpiling, um, we look at that and percentages is easier for states to report on. So that's how we ask the question, but that's something I think that we'll be really interested in looking at for COVID uh, specifically. I think that those are the main COVID related questions that we added in, though I do think there's quite a few related COVID questions in informatics as well. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So at this time, um, we will wrap up today's webinar. The recording will be shared with those who registered and will be um, transcribed and made available on the HIMCA webpage. And um, if we have any other additional questions, we'll follow up through the email. Sounds good. Thank you so much for presenting today and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye.